Kitty Sharps, it's Miss Amanda from the library. Happy October, it's Science Month. And this week we're learning about the great minds of science. Today we're going to read about George Washington Carver, a man who was born a slave, but grew up to be an amazing scientist and inventor. I hope you enjoy a picture book of George Washington Carver. A picture book of George Washington Carver. Written by David A. Adler. Illustrated by Dan Brown. George Washington Carver was born a slave. He was never sure of his birth date, just that it was in 1864 or early 1865, near the end of the Civil War. He was born on the Missouri farm of Moses and Susan Carver, where his mother Mary was a slave. George hardly knew his mother. When he was an infant, raiders kidnapped him and his mother and took them to Arkansas. A neighbor found George and brought him home, but he didn't find Mary. Young George Washington Carver never saw her again. George's father was a slave too, but George never met him. His father worked on a neighbor's farm and was killed in an accident around the time George was born. George and his brother James were raised by Moses and Susan Carver. The Carvers were good to the boys. George called Mr. Carver Uncle Moses. George was not a strong boy. He wrote later that his body was in constant warfare between life and death. The Carvers did not make him work hard on the farm. He fed the animals and helped Susan Carver around the house. He had plenty of time to swim and explore the nearby woods. George had his own little garden. He wrote later, I wanted to know every strange stone, flower, insect, bird, or beast, and many are the tears I have shed because I would break the roots or flower off some of those pets. But he hid his garden in the brush because it was considered foolishness in that neighborhood to waste time on flowers. The Carvers wanted him educated the same as white children. They taught me to read, spell, and write just a little. George needed to know more. His only book was a Webster's Elementary Spelling Book. He read it so often he knew it by heart. But that book had few answers for him. When George was 12, he went to a school for African-American children in nearby Neosho. There, he lived with Mariah and Andrew Watkins, a black couple. He paid for his room and food by helping around the house. His Aunt Mariah was a nurse. George learned from her which plants and herbs cured illnesses. She also taught him the value of time. Even during school recess, he had to run home to help Mariah with the laundry. There was no time for play. The teacher in the Enosha school did not know much more than George. After less than a year there, George felt he needed to move on. He found a family on its way to Fort Scott, Kansas, almost 100 miles away, and he hitched a ride. In Fort Scott, George went to school, worked in a nearby grocery, and did laundry for people staying at the Wilder House, a hotel. He lived with a blacksmith and his family and helped out there too. In March 1879, in Fort Scott, a mob of masked white men pulled a black prisoner out of jail, tied him with a rope, and dragged him for five blocks. The prisoner was hanged and later burned. George Washington Carver witnessed that lynching and quickly left Fort Scott. The ugly memory of that night haunted George for the rest of his life. He went to Olathe, Kansas. From there, he went to Paola, Kansas, and then to Minneapolis, Kansas, where he graduated from high school. Carver said, Carver still had what he called the thirst for knowledge. In 1885, he applied by mail and was accepted to Highland University. But when he arrived to begin his studies, he was told that he could not attend the school because he was black. George Washington Carver changed his plans. He became a farmer and bought land farther west. He built a one-room sod house with walls made of thick chunks of grassy dirt and a roof made of tar paper and dirt. He planted vegetables, studied art, and made friends. But he became restless. 
he still had his thirst to learn. Carver traveled east to Iowa, and in September 1890, he enrolled in Simpson College. He was the school's first African-American student. He studied art there, but soon realized he could do more for his people working with plants. He transferred to Iowa State College, where he studied agriculture. At Iowa State, Carver joined debating German and art clubs. He became a trainer for the school's football team and held prayer meetings. God and religion were always important to him. When he studied nature, he felt he was getting closer to God by learning more about his creations. George Washington Carver graduated from Iowa State in 1894 and became the school's first African-American teacher. He also continued his studies. By 1896, he had earned a Master of Science degree. In 1896, Booker T. Washington, one of the most respected African Americans of the time, asked Harvard to join him at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. The school was established in 1881 to train African Americans for work, and George Washington Carver became the head of the Department of Agriculture. He lived and worked there for the rest of his life. Carver was devoted to improving the lives of Southerners, especially African Americans. Most of them were cotton farmers. Constant cotton planting ruined the soil, and in some years, entire crops were destroyed by boll weevils, small beetles that left their eggs in the cotton flower buds. Carver was determined to find other crops that would grow well in the South and could support Southern farmers. Carver found that peanuts and sweet potatoes improved the land and were not threatened by boll weevils. He called them two of the greatest products God has given us. He knew Americans would not eat as many peanuts and sweet potatoes as Southern farmers could grow, so he looked for new uses for them. In his laboratory, Carver separated the fats, gums, sugars, starches, and other chemical parts of the peanut. He worked with these components and found some 300 different peanut byproducts, including peanut milk, flour, cheese, candy, ice cream, butter, shampoo, face cream, glue, wood stain, and ink. He even discovered that rubbing a certain kind of peanut oil into the skin was helpful for treating polio, a crippling disease that often affected children. He found he could make more than 100 useful products from sweet potatoes, including flour, syrup, starch, a coffee-like drink, molasses, glue, vinegar, alcohol, and synthetic rubber. George Washington Carver loved his work. He said, no science and science shall set you free because science is truth. Carver believed his discoveries came as a direct message from God and refused to accept any money for them. Sometimes he did not even cash his paychecks from Tuskegee. The great inventor Thomas Alva Edison offered Carver a huge salary to work for him, but Carver refused. He wanted to work only for the good of his people, African Americans. George Washington Carver believed in the goodness of all people, that we are brothers, all of us. He felt that successful blacks such as himself should be models for others who together would transform the race in the eyes of the world. Carver liked to say, save everything. From what you have, make what you want. In 1941, he displayed his handcrafts made of seeds, peanuts, and chicken feathers. Also in Tuskegee exhibit were 71 of his paintings many done with paints he made from vegetables, magnolias, and Alabama clay. Time Magazine, in its review of the exhibit, called Carver the Black Leonardo, a reference to Leonardo da Vinci, a genius in many fields. George Washington Carver won many awards for his work. In 1923, the National Association for Advancement of Colored People gave him the Spingard Medal. In 1939, he was given the Theodore Roosevelt Medal for Distinguished Research in Agricultural Chemistry. George Washington Carver died on January 5, 1943 at Tuskegee Institute. People from all over the world mourned his death.